All right, so today is the fourth and last of these of these planned lectures on pumps in water and wastewater systems. Uh, if you got a chance to attend uh, the last week's lecture, I kind of recapped through the fundamental hydraulics and things like that that led up to lecture three, uh, and then we talked about um, more specific things that we hadn't talked about in lectures one and two. Today's plan is to move on and talk about some more practical issues about maybe um, life cycle cost versus initial cost and uh, reasons that we see uh, damage and um, in on suboptimal operation or performance for pumps and so on. So we had the we had a prior discussion about operational efficiency of pumps and that each pump is built to uh, certain requirements and certain specifications, and so it has a sometimes narrow window of operational efficiency. So. Uh, before you choose a pump for a particular application, it's very important to make sure that you're aware of the range of operation, both in terms of discharge range and also maybe viscosity of fluid uh, and so on, uh, and choose the pump accordingly. Because if we don't make a good choice, we may end up with continuing problems throughout the life cycle of that pump and leading to early replacement, or if not that, leading to very large life cycle costs, which are masked by a low upfront cost, possibly. So making a choice based on operations is very closely tied to making that choice based on economics and what you expect that pump to cost over the time that you project for as its design life or its useful life. Um, some of the terminology that we will come across in today's uh, meeting are different types of pumps different, based on the characteristics of flow that goes through them um, and what are the, some of the broad guidelines about choosing the appropriate type of pumps for uh, different applications. When you are in a particular niche industry, uh, then it's quite possible that um, your pump selection is also a uh, very narrow windowed, meaning that you are likely to always see flows within a certain range and the type of pumpage in terms of solids content and in terms of viscosity and all that is also within a narrow range. And so that makes your job easier in that you choose as long as your previous choice of pumps has been judicial, then you just continue to choose the same type, maybe the later model that's available in the market. But sometimes when your needs change, then your decision has to be made over as to now, now that we are talking about a different type of fluid and a different type of uh, discharge, uh, then what are my priorities? And so based on that, what should my choice be? Um, so a very broad discussion about pump types. We can um, divide them broadly up into centrifugal pumps and positive displacement pumps. A positive displacement pump is more like a piston where you are, you are pushing the fluid and giving it the energy as a result of that push and that compression, whereas a centrifugal pump, you are essentially spinning the fluid and adding energy and therefore a pressure buildup as a result of that kinetic energy that you are uh, transmitting to the fluid in the, the volute, as they say, uh, within the casing. Uh, for centrifugal pumps, which is what we are largely concentrating on, Broad division is radial pumps, where the, that is, this classification is based on the direction or the nature of the flow within the pump casing. Radial 
versus axial versus somewhere in between. And many pumps, even though they are classified as centrifugal pumps, where you expect the fluid flow velocity to be tangent to that to that casing, and so um, um, you have you have a certain amount of axial flow mixed in with it, and so um, the mixed will be radial to a certain extent and axial to a certain extent. The nature of the flow within the casing. And there are also many other sub subgroups of, um, of pumps within uh, each family. In terms of, in terms of um, where you put the pump into use, uh, there are classifications such as uh, submersible pumps, piston pumps, rotary lobe, lobe pumps, peristaltic pumps, diaphragm pumps, and so on. And this classification has to do more with the mechanism that is um, that is adding the the pressure or the adding the energy to the to the fluid within the pump body. Now, in terms of Classifying the flow within a pump as to whether it's radial or axial or mixed, uh, and also to um, when you're when you're talking about uh, figuring out whether a pump is appropriate for a particular operation or not, uh, there is one dimensionless uh, characteristic that is often used. It's called the specific speed. And the definition of the specific speed is up to the upper left of the slide, where we use the rotational speed, the flow rate, and the head that that pump uh, is going to give or impart to the fluid, which is equivalent to the pressure, to the delta P or the pressure increase. But uh, with these um, variables in that definition, we end up with a dimensionless number. And so you can compare pumps of different scale. Whenever you're comparing facilities of different scale, uh, then a dimensionless number is always uh, useful or the way to go. And so if we look at the range of, uh, of these, of the specific speed, you can see on the upper right corner of the slide that very approximately on the lower end of specific speed from 500 to 4,000, uh, you have essentially uh, radial or predominantly radial flow and and the upper range of specific speed up into the 20 and the 10,000s and 20,000s you have predominantly axial flow um, so if you are ever faced with a situation where you know the discharge that you are uh, expected to put through and you know the head difference that that pump is expected to impart to the fluid, then a combination of those two things can sometimes lead to a broad selection of the pump type, and then uh, then you can get more specific from then on. Uh, there's a numerical example in this slide that talks about a head of 500 feet, a pump speed of 2,000 RPM, and a discharge of 1,200 gallons per minute. If we put those things here, so you can see that the discharge is low, but the head requirement is very, very high. And so if you put that together in that calculation, in that calculation of the specific speed, it turns out to be uh, sub 1,000, which leads to that you, a radial flow pump will be appropriate uh, in, that, in that situation. Um, so some more comments here. Centrifugal pump impellers have specific speed values ranging from 500 to 10,000 um, with radial flow. Uh, and these are the same ranges that we're showing up there. Um, so centrifugal pumps can be subdivided in terms of the nature of the flow within the pump casing into into uh, these three. <clears throat> the mix being the vibrant hybrid, but when we say radial flow, we're talking about purely radial flow, and when we're talking about axial flow, we're talking about purely axial flow. Uh, 
Um, and if you have really low numbers of specific speed, then typically a positive displacement pump is basically what is most appropriate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there is a little bit more about this on the next slide that talks about um, when you have low specific speed radial flow impellers, they develop hydraulic head principally through centrifugal force and higher specific speeds develop head partly by centrifugal force and partly by axial force, right? So if you think about um, an axial flow and what are we talking about there and if you can look at these these diagrams here, the positive displacement flow here is basically you're pushing that volute to uh, in with a, a piston-like device to generate or to impart energy and therefore that energy then is imparted to the fluid and becomes available as a pressure rise or, or a head. Whereas in the second diagram you can see a centrifugal pump casing where the flow is being spun in circular and the flow is essentially going out from the eye at the center to the uh, outside part, the annular space in the outside part of the casing, and then the impellers are basically rotating it until they are discharged through the discharge piping on this side. So at that point, that discharge is, the flow direction is radial outwards into that outer part of the casing, and then that discharge, the velocity of that fluid is essentially tangential, right? And it exits in a tangential direction. On the other hand, if you think about something like a propeller-driven flow, where the flow is, the, the, the impellers are essentially guiding the fluid backwards to exit, but in an axial direction, right? So the flow is along the axis of that, of that impeller or that turbine. And um, and then it's discharging like that. So just by looking at the nature of the impeller and its relationship to within the body of the casing and what the flow direction is, you can broadly classify the pump as a positive displacement or a radial or axial flow type pump. Now, uh, I don't know whether, yeah, Ahmed is here. Ahmed, you had asked a question at the end of lecture three about a relationship between pump speed and net positive suction head required. And my off-the-cuff answer at that time had been, my understanding is these curves, the NPSHR curves, which we talked about in relation to cavitation and so on, that these are established empirically through a bunch of testing uh, at different conditions and then you put together all that data and you generate the curves. Now, I did find an article which went through the uh, relevant equations that would relate the pump speed and the flow and the discharge and the NPSHR and so on. And essentially what they're calling NPS NPSHR in that study is the pressure loss or the head loss that occurs within the pump and that's what has to be made up for by the NPSHR. Um, um, then there's a comparison between the results of that calculation, which is the solid line on the curve on the left, and the published data, which is empirical, which is based on testing. And so it shows fairly good agreement. Um, it's quite possible that the published data has some added factor of safety beyond the theoretical basis added into it, which would which would essentially put them right on top of each other, right? Um, this one, the first curve on the left, basically is showing a variation of the NPSHR, which is on the y-axis, versus the crankshaft speed, N in RPM, which is on the x-axis. And to look at the same results, but for different uh, 
densities of fluids. So there was another curve generated or a set of curves generated for uh, the lowest, the middle curve here is water, the specific gravity of one. The lower curve um, is a specific gravity of 0.5 and the upper curve is a specific gravity of 1.5. So you can see that that's a significant variation, 50% on either side in terms of specific gravity. And the NPSHR requirements are not dramatically different. Um, and if you look at it, if I just pick a point where my cursor is, um, for a 0 0.5 specific gravity, this is showing a NPSHR of around 6 or 5.5. For water, it's showing 6. And for 1.5 specific gravity, it's showing 7. So that's, that's not a huge uh, or a very broad uh, uh, window of variation. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I was glad that I didn't have to leave that off with my my cop-out answer because I didn't really know at that point. Uh, this is a table that essentially um, very broadly talks about uh, the different characteristics of different types of pumps rotary, reciprocating, centrifugal, and so on. And it basically gives their characteristics in terms of flow rate that they are ideal for and um, whether they can handle solids, whether they require any special kind of valves, whether they can handle uniform flow or pulsating flow, and all these different aspects of choosing a pump. I mean, it all depends on what your application is and, and uh, what the conditions are for that particular application. And so I've circled a few things, but it would be useful to, to take a look at um, this and maybe make your first choice or your broad choice based on these uh, characteristics. So you can see that centrifugal pumps are appropriate when the flow rate is high, but when the head is relatively relatively low, okay? Optimum pressures, I um, think that's how we are expressing head in this particular table, um, low to medium for centrifugal pumps, but high for reciprocating pumps. Um, there's also, especially in the wastewater industry, there is uh, solids, whether a particular type of pump can handle embedded uh, solids in the flow or not, that also becomes a big um, decision criterion. And based on that, somewhat based on that data, is a graphical plot of head versus discharge and the various types of pumps that are appropriate for different regimes of uh, head and uh, discharge. So you can see here reciprocating is, uh, is in the low discharge but high head uh, region of the curve, whereas centrifugal is more uh, high discharge, low to medium head um, domain. Uh, in general, the geometry or the geography, whatever you choose to call it, of a centrifugal pump, you have the suction piping where the flow comes in, um, your um, volute is within within this within this chamber that's a light blue. Um, uh, the um, casing itself is obviously the um, mechanically stable body that's holding everything together and of course any it must be designed for all um, dynamic forces um, that uh, that the casing experiences as the flow goes through it and the discharge piping is out of that volume chamber discharging uh, tangentially um, and then the crankshaft that is basically spinning the impeller blades um, is right down that, that axis right there. 
Okay. So many, many parts to it, uh, the, the electrical, the mechanical, um, all that plays a role in uh, the overall efficiency of the pump as to how well um, that pump is um, connected to the uh, optimum conditions that it is designed for. So when you get when you get something operating way outside, it's what's called the op uh, allowable or preferable operating range, then you get a variety of issues and problems, which then can lead to long-term uh, long -term cost issues as well, because the maintenance cost then uh, eclipses the initial capital costs. And not only cost of maintaining the pump, but also if you think about the industry that, that all of us are most likely in, the water and wastewater, none of those can really suffer downtime. So in terms of uh, user costs and um, uh, the impacts are very, 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 very high. <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all of this. People are going, phew. Uh, this is just, I thought I'll put in, uh, I always advise folks about putting too much text on a slide and I've done it here. But um, some other information that if for those who are interested, if you want to do more reading, there is, um, there is uh, information here. Uh, there is something about um, priming the pump. Um, I don't see, okay, there was a question last time, but I'll answer it privately. Um, so basically, uh, some pumps have to be primed and some are self-priming. And so, um, the uh, situation of the pump becoming airbound and therefore failing to function can be an issue. So that aspect of the pump design and how it ideally operates. Uh, if it's not self-priming, then it has to be primed or filled with fluid before it can start becoming operational and functional. Uh, very simply, over probably oversimplified uh, example of the operational cost of pumps from just the the power requirements. So uh, the 0.746 is basically a factor that converts horsepower to kilowatts. And that's only there because in this example, the cost, the rate, the unit cost, the lowercase c is basically a dollars per kilowatt kind of calculation. So what we have done is the rest of the numbers lead to a horsepower and then that is converted to kilowatts, and then once that kilowatts is multiplied by the unit cost, and that gives you a dollar figure. So essentially, if you then look at the variables here, this is the cost per hour, and so if you want to extrapolate that into a power cost per uh, over, over the entire life cycle, you can. Uh, the flow rate, and we had talked about this pump power equation where essentially you have the specific gravity of the fluid, uh, you have the uh, flow rate in either gallons per minute or in cubic feet per second, and then you have the head that that pump is expected to deliver. So the head in feet is in here. The one thing that's missing here in this equation is actually this 3960 assumes that we are talking about water, right? But we could have also plugged in a specific gravity um, variable in here to account for that. Because what's supposed to be in here is the unit weight of the fluid and not just, not just assuming that it's water. So this 3960 empirical constant is if it's water, but if you want to modify it for another specific gravity, then you can multiply it by that number up in the numerator. The two um, efficiency numbers here relate to the motor efficiency and the pump efficiency, or you can have a combined efficiency number. So you can see right here with the numbers that we have in this example, 100 gallons per minute, head of 10 feet, uh, 
electricity unit cost is 10 cents per kilowatt hour and then that gives you a operational power cost of uh, consumption cost of about 2.4 cents per hour. There is obviously more to calculating the cost, the cost of running a pump uh, than just the power um, uh, expenses. Um, and then we get into a life cycle costing of the pump where you look at the capital expenditure which is basically the purchase price of the pump plus installation costs. Um, and then you have um, <clears throat> normal system maintenance and then um, periodical uh, major maintenance and then uh, downtime costs in terms of if we have some kind of uh, projection based on experience typically of how often we uh, need to service these pumps and therefore them being taken out of service then what does that mean in terms of um, for example let's say that your analysis leads to in a um, pump house with four pumps that the fourth is redundant to handle the capacity you need three which means you're right there you are to handle the downtime you are in, in increasing a your costs by 33 percent because you're adding one to the array uh, to have the option to have three pumps service the the peak flows and and have one taken down at this at the same time uh, you have obviously as these things age you have leaks and things like that and so there are environmental costs to to build in and any major expenditures will probably fall under these uh, maintenance costs which are not so much uh, the regular or um, frequent maintenance but rather the periodic maintenance which may be the operating procedures say every three years or every four years you have to have major maintenance on these pumps and then uh, you then can account for uh, residual value into it at the end of the life cycle as to does it hold any residual value or uh, that that can be a cost offset at that time Okay, you can see this note that this is very broad, obviously doesn't, it's not something to uh, hang your hat on uh, for every situation, but typically capital costs are less than 20% of total costs. So making a decision solely based on capital costs is not wise. So there's an example that I found and that we can talk about is, uh, talks about a life cycle cost example for a particular situation where you have a, um, a pump that handles a fluid from a storage tank to a pressurized tank from here to a pressurized tank heat exchanger heats the fluid and control valve regulates the rate of flow at 350 gallons per minute that's the system and the problem in this case is that the control valve has been has shown a pattern of a fairly regular pattern of failure about once a year due to erosion caused by cavitation and every time that happens cost of replacing that that valve is four thousand dollars so the alternatives here are replace the flow control valve with one that can resist cavitation right uh, the problem would go away at the expense at a probably a fairly major expenditure uh, b is trim the impeller so that the pump does not develop as much head resulting in lower pressure drop across the control valve that will affect your operational costs most likely um, install a vfd and remove the um, the flow control valve the vfd can vary the pump speed and thus achieve the desired flow process uh, this also is a upfront cost that can make the problem quote unquote go away 
or leave the system as is and incur the annual expense of repair to the flow control valve. Now this is always your sort of your baseline uh, to compare alternatives to. So when you're considering alternatives A, B, and C, your comparison is to the status quo as to how the situation is at this moment, which is option D. So if you look at, I mean, we won't be able to go through this in a ton of detail, but if you look at the first um, graph here, you know, when I had this in slide uh, presentation mode, which caused issues for some folks, which is, so I'm not using that mode, these were animated to show up on top of each other, right? So they could be seen easily, but right now, let me just bring that to front. So what this is showing is it's showing the uh, pump curves, the blue lines, for different size impellers. So there's a 375 millimeter impeller curve that is the lower one, and then there is a 430 millimeter um, impeller diameter, which is the upper one, which is what we have right now. So the one of the options was to trim the impeller size, in other words, to go from the 430 millimeter to the 375 millimeter. And as you can see that that curve would then intersect the system curve at, at a different point. So the system curve for option A and D, option A was to add the uh, flow control valve, right? Option D was to add the flow control valve that to a model that can resist cavitation. And option D was, sorry, did I say option D? Option A. And option D was to leave the system as it is. For those two options, you have a system curve that looks like this right here. Okay, the black curve to the on the left of those three options. And with options B and C, we have worked out the system curves as they will be. Okay. Remember, we had talked about, I think in lecture three, we had talked about the idea of throttling, in other words, um, using, choking the flow somewhat, and as you choke the flow and you throttle it, the system curve gets pushed to the left. And so A and D, B and C options are less throttled, so there is less resistance to the flow within the uh, pump, pump itself, and so we have to generate these system curves and therefore from that look at the intersections of that curve and whichever impeller that we are using. Um, so that's the source, that's the background work that must be done in order to determine what the characteristics of the different uh, options are. So if I now bring this middle one up to front, uh, based on that, you can see that for options A and D, A, C, and D actually, we have the same impeller size, but option B was to trim the impeller. So that's one is the 375 millimeter impeller. And all the characteristics in terms of the, the discharge, the rate of flow, uh, uh, the pump head, the efficiency, all of these parameters have then been worked out from the basis of these of the data embedded in the first of that first doc, of that first figure <clears throat> and based on that we have some power consumption calculations as well so we have you can see widely varying power consumption options a and d are identical 23 kilowatts whereas options b and c are similar and much lower at 14 and 12 kilowatts respectively so from that power consumption, we can convert it to um, uh, to energy cost per year. So that will be a recurring cost that has to be, that can be bundled in with your annual maintenance costs and treated as a, as an annual cost throughout the life cycle of that, of that pump. And upfront costs, um, modifying the impeller has a upfront cost involved.
installing a VFD in option C has a large upfront cost and uh, keeping the system as it is has a annual cost of four thousand uh, dollars per year but no upfront cost because obviously we are not doing anything so when you compare all these numbers and then you reduce see there are different kinds of uh, costs that we are talking about we are talking about some that occur upfront capital costs there are some that occur every year so that's like a treated to, uh, like an annuity and there are some costs that occur not once but not every year either but maybe at prescribed intervals like maybe every four years or every three years major maintenance uh, that would be typically like that so all that data is summarized in this table and based on all that if you do a calculation and in order to do the calculation we typically use um, either some program that has these equations embedded or the tables like this which convert something like they convert like the P over A factor essentially converts an annuity into an equivalent capital cost right so if you have a thousand dollar maintenance costs every year but if you want to compare all your costs to upfront uh, cost in, other, uh, in order to lump it in with the capital cost then you need to for example if your design period design life is eight years and your interest rate is eight percent that's those that's what this table is for for eight percent um, then you get a multiplier of 5.75 approximately which means the for those eight years the eight installments that you will pay for each year's annual maintenance in terms of today's dollars is essentially equivalent to about 5.75 years or 5.75 times each of those yearly or annual installments so we use these kind of factors to essentially convert everything to apples to apples instead of lumping together different types of costs that doesn't make sense so if I look at option A in detail which was the change the flow control valve we come up with the overall cost life cycle cost of ninety two thousand dollars approximately okay embedded in that number are the initial cost and you can go back and forth to the table on the past slide we have a twenty five hundred dollars every two years so this is like major maintenance uh, every two years and that that twenty five hundred dollars converted to today's dollars actually becomes using these factors becomes these numbers so if you add them together over eight years there'll be four instances of that that adds up to about seven thousand dollars and then five hundred dollars every year for eight years is an annual expenditure so we multiplied it by that factor that's highlighted in yellow that gives us about another three thousand and fuel costs you can see or rather the energy costs is the big is the big one of all of the components that came up to about seventy eight thousand dollars in today's dollars over uh, if you recall the annual uh, energy cost for this option for option a was somewhere around eleven thousand dollars so eleven thousand um, and then incorporating in inflation and then scaling it back to today's dollars uh, we get these numbers and that series of eight numbers then adds up to 78,000 obviously all of these can be facilitated with a spreadsheet if you're doing a 20-year life cycle obviously you don't want to do it one by one by one but a tool like a spreadsheet can make facilitate this very easily so anyway adding up all of that gave us a $92,000 life cycle cost if you look at uh, the same numbers or similar calculations for option B C and D it turns out that option B which was trimming the impeller has the lowest life cycle cost of all four uh, is that is that apparent if I if I were to just look at this table and see option B turns out 
to be the winner by a wide margin? It's not. There's so many different types of numbers that are embedded in here that it's hard to judge. We can probably look at the option C and the very high upfront cost and say, well, that probably will rule it out. But uh, but still, to make a accurate estimate, uh, we need to go through uh, what we just summarized here. In fact, this option, option B, the cost is about half of what option D is, which is do nothing. And then based on that, you can express that result as a as a uh, benefit to cost ratio, which uh, obviously then you what you do is you take the differentials. You, you take this as a baseline, right? Option D as your baseline. And then you say, what is the initial cost involved in trimming the impeller? 2250 minus zero. So that becomes your relative cost. B relative to D. And then uh, what is the annuity? Um, then you have to look at all the expenses so like line 2 which is a uh, exp maintenance expense every two years and then line 3 is a annual maintenance expense and then fuel costs is a annual um, energy expense. So you take all of those and you then again compare them relative to um, relative to the numbers for option D which is the status quo and then you get a, a benefit versus a cost the benefit in this case would be a reduction in maintenance costs um, and so when you put that together you get a benefit cost ratio I wish I had just done that as well over here but if you want to refresh your engineering economics concepts you can you can figure that out of what is the benefit cost ratio of uh, option b relative to option d the best one um i thought that i had embedded this slide i should have talked about this sooner but i thought i had talked about this in lecture three when we were talking about it but this is another look at, we talked about it, but I just didn't have this slide up. Uh, basically, we had talked about how the system curve intersects with the, uh, the pump curve, and that gives us our ideal operating point and the best efficiency point, essentially. That's that point. And then on either side, a margin on either side of that creates a a preferred operating region, if you will, POR, and then depending on the characteristics of the pump and its tendency to develop vibration and noise and these kind of issues and bearing failures, there might be another slightly broader range that says an allowable uh, operating range uh, region. So you're allowed to sort of migrate into that, but if you do that over a long period of time, consistently then you will definitely have significantly reduced um, <clears throat> operational life uh, projections so this this uh, curve kind of like a schematic that captures that causes of pump damage we have talked about these in terms of cavitation uh, causes uh, causes vibration, corrosion, wearing of bearings, and the vibration indirectly then causing bearing wear, uh, seal damage, leakage, environmental costs. So one thing leading to another, uh, like a cascade of events, if, um, if the primary problem is not, is not solved. Uh, pump priming, we talked about it uh, in another slide, and that is basically the impellers um, are, depending on the type of pump, um, the impellers are designed to push the fluid, but not necessarily to start up in a in a empty uh, situation. So for pumps that are not self-priming, you have to prime the pump before you get them going. Um, and failure to do so can also cause uh, 
cause failures or can cause operational issues as the pump is operated incorrectly. Um, there was a question from Chris who is not here today, but the question was an actual situation that they encountered where because of the requirements um, in a particular um, pump installation, they when they turned on pumps one and let's just say I don't remember exactly the details when they turned on pumps one and two there was there was a decision made that two pumps didn't need to really be running at the same time to handle the flow that 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 was being handled and so when they turned one pump off it caused the other one to become gas bound even though the um, the wet well levels did not really fall really low to indicate the cause for the pump being gas bound and he was asking if I could think about why that happened it was kind of strange of why it happened with one pump being turned off first it happened but with the other pump being turned off first it did not so uh, I I really I wish Chris was here, but I couldn't really brainstorm it to come up with exactly why that happened in that situation. Um, another thing unrelated to pumps, but of course your pumps are delivering the flow to a system. And um, then uh, if you are analyzing that system made up of a network of pipes and so on, it's a related but, but not uh, not the same issue but a related issue is how do you then analyze a pipe network to figure out what the different what the head is at different places what the pressure loss is uh, on different segments uh, in the in the past uh, these analysis of uh, link systems as you want to call them uh, used to be done iteratively until everything all the fundamental equations of energy and continuity are essentially satisfied uh, but now you have software to basically run that those equations over and over until um, until you get some kind of convergence so the um, Hardy cross method is basically for a system such as this uh, where you can't come up with a linear solution but rather your solution has to be iterative because everything you changed in one link or one segment of that network affects what happens in the other parts of the network but these are there are uh, software there are programs that can basically execute the same analysis and this is just as a closing slide because of where we live and work these are the different pressure zones um, and in order to deliver from a particular source to a particular pressure zone you then have to uh, you have your uh, part of your facilities is, is these pump stations which then depending on what and where they have to pump to um, then their capacities and the pump um, requirements the specifications of the pump installations then get determined by uh, what kind of elevation um, are you uh, overcoming how far are you sending the flow which will affect all the losses that occur over uh, as a function of distance um, and then uh, what kind of uh, if you're delivering water it's one thing but if you're talking about pumping sewage uh, to the pump to the sewage treatment plants then what kind of fluid are you are you pumping through so this is a uh, just a very it's it, it's not comprehensive you guys probably have access to a better map but I wanted something that would fit on one screen and show what the different pressure zones are um, of of the system that we probably deal with most of the time all right so that's that gives me 10 minutes to go so I can stop there and take any questions if you guys have any.
<clears throat> I will, um, like last time, I will share the a PDF of the slides like I did last time I sent it to uh, to Mike and I think he sent it out to the group. Any questions, discussion? So, um, and, and you can feel free to send me questions after the fact also um, via email. Guillermo, what do you think? If there are no questions, should we close here or? You're still muted. And like last time, I will, since we are re recorded this, I will uh, post this one as well and share the YouTube uh, link with Mike, who can then distribute it. It's all quiet. No comments, no questions. Let me see, somebody texted, wrote something. Oh, you Raj, you're welcome. Yeah, I wish I could have, on, especially on this last one, I've been so swamped uh, with the two projects that last week has been uh, nightmarish. All right, so if nobody has any objections, I can first of all close the recording.